Good afternoon, folks. Um, I hope everybody can hear okay, and thank you for tuning in to today's webinar. Um, we are expecting a few more participants, so um, I'll give a brief introduction, and hopefully during that time, a few more may have tuned in, and a few may more, a few more may tune in throughout the course of um, the webinar. Um, my name is Johnny Bell, and I'm the um, policy manager here at Northern Ireland Environment Link. I'm here with my colleague Connor McLean. Uh, Northern Ireland Environment Link is the forum and networking body for the environmental sector here in Northern Ireland. And one of the projects that we deliver, one of the programs, is called the Pioneer Program. And it's really aiming to raise awareness and understanding of the UN Sustainable Development Goals across the public and private sector um, and also within the community and voluntary sector. Um, we've run a couple of webinars to date which have really been focusing on where government are at in terms of delivery of the SDGs or not delivering the SDGs as the case may be. Um, and there's a bit of a demand at the last webinar to have a look at well, what are individual sectors doing, i.e. can we have a look at examples of the SDGs in action. And that's when we came across the Better Retail, Better uh, World initiative, uh, which is looking at how the which is a program based around how the retail sector is adopting some of the UN Sustainable Development Goals to influence their particular practices. Um, so I'm delighted today that we have uh, Peter Andrews from the British Retail Consortium. He's the head of sustainability policy at the British Retail Consortium. And also Ian Ferguson, who is tuned in from the cooperative group, and he's the environment manager there. So uh, we're going to kick off uh, by hearing firstly from Peter. Uh, and he's going to speak for around 15 or 20 minutes and that's going to be followed by uh, a talk from Ian and then we'll have time for some question and answers at the end. If you do have any questions that you want to raise please include them in the comment box um, and we will uh, address those following the presentations. So we're going to try and hand over to Peter here, make him the presenter and share his screen um, to kick things off. Are you there, Peter? I'm here, yes. Yeah. Good stuff. Welcome. Okay, tell me if you can see my screen. Not just yet. We can hear you very clearly anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, bear with me one moment. It looks like yeah. you're on the way, yeah, waiting to view Peter's screen. Uh, okay, one moment. Sorry about this. No problem. Okay, do you all see it now? Yep, can yeah, do. Yep. That's it. There we go. Excellent. Okay, so I'm Peter Andrews and I'm Head of Sustainability Policy here at the British Retail Consortium. Um, we are the trade association of retailers right across the UK and work with both governments and stakeholders as well as retailers to, to progress a number of different uh, areas and my area is uh, sustainability, looking at the environmental and social issues. I'm going to uh, give, go to a presentation today on our initiative, Better Retail, Better World. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about why we got to, to this initiative, uh, what exactly it is, and then uh, help uh, everyone get a bit more of a sense of, of really what it means to a retailer. So first of all, I'm going to play a video, um, and the link to that video will come up in your chat box. Um, on the go to meeting uh, and then uh, co-op will be going through uh, what they're doing on the SDGs and how that also links to better retail better world so uh, first of all I'll start with a bit of context um, as you know uh, the retail industry across the UK is, is quite an influential industry uh, with the largest private sector employer um, and in terms of the UK economy, we represent about 5% um, of, of the GDP. Um, 
but I'm also sure you're aware that it's a very disruptive time to be in retail. Um, and that image that you can see there on, on the presentation slide is probably going to look quite different in about five years' time. Um, our industry is important to the UK. We provide consumer choice product innovation and job creation. Um, but as I mentioned, we are facing huge disruptions and that's led to nearly two and a half thousand fewer retail stores in the UK than there were three years ago. Um, uh, and growing number of retail insolvencies and uh, profitability falling quite uh, across the sector. So when we look at all of those challenges, uh, there are a number of reasons why we're facing those. So uh, a big one of those is uh, increasing costs. And we've got a number of different pieces of uh, government policy uh, squeezing those costs for retail. And at the same time, we recognize that we've got to be preparing more for the future. So retraining workforce for the digital economy, uh, investing in new technology to better uh, adapt uh, for the future. And at the same time, we've got the challenge of Brexit, uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware of. And if we look at just one example, so in food, 50% uh, of our food is imported in the UK, 60% of that comes from the EU. Um, in the event of no deal, uh, it's estimated that there will be about a 29% increase in the cost of importing from non-tariff barriers. And again, that will lead to uh, you know, greater chances of uh, small retail businesses going out of business. Um, so from a retail point of view, we've got all of these pressures facing us. And at the same time, we also have a, a challenge that trust in business is, at, uh, is declining at the moment. Um, and if we look at the Enderman uh, Trust Barometer, um, it's tracking that there's a low and declining trust in business. And particularly, this is um, more prevalent around uh, younger people, so potentially the future customers of retailers. Um, so we are not meeting their, their expectations on terms of trust. Um, and you know, for those of you listening in today, if you wonder why trust is a big issue for retailers, um, you probably want to ask yourself, would you shop in a, in a, at a business that you don't trust yourself? So with this trust issue, it's obviously a huge concern to retailers. And there is a, a number of things that we need to be doing to better um, uh, regain that trust with the, with the public. If we look back at potentially some of the root causes of why uh, this trust is at an all-time low, um, we need to look at a sort of global level. So globalization has led to huge successes in terms of health, wealth, and education life expectancy over the last 30 years. Um, but there are growing signs of market failures from uh, increasing frequency of climate change, um, biodiversity and ecosystem loss across the planet, which is impacting on global uh, GDP. Um, if we look at equality, so 40% of today's global workforce are female, and yet just 5% of global CEO positions are held by women. Um, and income inequality across many countries is at its highest level for 30 years. Now, as a business, these are big, big global challenges, but what, what do they really mean to you as a business? Well, if these indicators do not improve over the short to medium term period, there's likely to be a popular backlash against businesses, and that could lead to increasingly drastic regulatory responses from government. So we recognize that these big, big challenges that are impacting people all across the world are potentially impacting the trust that our customers have with us um, could also impact us from, from the regulatory point of view. So there is... Uh, um, uh, an opportunity presented through uh, the government who came together in 2015 to establish the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with through this series of webinars. These goals um, are, are backed by core principles around everyone has a role to play in, in their delivery. So that's not just governments, but that does include businesses as well as civil society. All the goals are interconnected, so a real holistic approach is needed to, to drive meaningful progress on addressing these social, environmental, and economic um, areas. And, and above all, collaboration is key. So individual businesses can't do this alone. Individual governments can't do this alone. We need to be working together to really try and address these challenges. A business approach to the UN Sustainable Development Goals would first recognize the role that businesses uh, play uh, and the responsibility they have in society. 
and then focus uh, from a business perspective on where the greatest impacts are in the business's value chain. As retailers, uh, we came together um, a year ago and, and you know, recognizing the trust challenges we're facing, the other pressures that we're facing, recognizing this framework was there for us to make a meaningful contribution to. Um, and we recognized that we needed to um, uh, look at what our stakeholder expectations of us were with regards to all of this too. And we knew that, um, we understood from our discussions with those stakeholders that their sustainable development goals were becoming the norm to measure businesses. So the government at the moment is preparing a national action plan, which as part of it will assess what business action has been on the SDGs. And the outcomes of that could influence what future policy could look like. Um, and we know that investors are also backing uh, benchmarks uh, on the SDG, so benchmarking companies about how well they're performing against different indicators. Uh, a big example of that is the World Benchmarking Alliance. Um, and, and we can see that future mandatory reporting for companies is going to be very closely linked to that. And as well, um, civil society is, is looking at what businesses are doing and measuring, again, progress on that. And we see uh, an interesting example come through the corporate and human rights benchmark, which is also linked to the World Benchmarking Alliance. These benchmarks, uh, um, as civil society uh, measure businesses, uh, will be picked up by the media and again in turn uh, will impact um, uh, our customers' um, uh, understanding of what our businesses are up to. So we recognize that this is a growing, growing challenge and we recognize we as a retail industry have a, a responsibility to, to do what we can in this area. So we looked at all of these sustainable development goals there are, the 17 of them, and working both with retail um, companies as well as uh, external stakeholders, uh, some campaign groups and, and others, we identified that together we could focus very effectively in taking a leadership role in a number of uh, goals, um, whilst recognizing that we do have a responsibility to play in uh, contributing to the delivery of all of those. But there are at least a number of goals where we could really take that leadership position on. Uh, for those of you that are looking at the screen, you'll see that there are some goals missing, um, and uh, hopefully you will agree with uh, at least some of the key goals that we've identified um, at the British Retail Consortium in terms of what the retail industry should look at. And again, we're looking at these goals in terms of where the retail industry has the greatest impact on. So, as I mentioned at the start of this presentation, we are the largest private sector employer in the UK, so we have a huge impact on uh, our direct employees, but then also there are millions of people in our supply chains. And again, linking to that, we have an influence over inequalities or improving equality. We have a huge uh, role in our local communities that we operate in, um, and obviously responsible consumption and production is uh, essential to, to the retail industry. And climate action, um, I won't go into the detail, but you know, it, it's, it's going to have an impact. It's already having an impact on the retail industry. It's going to have a greater impact on the retail industry and the wider society. So we know that that's an essential um, area that we need to focus efforts on. But all of these areas are um, interlinked. So we know that actions to um, address good health and well-being will also contribute to decent work and economic growth, help uh, reduce inequalities, contribute to sustainable communities. So whilst we take, as I say, a leadership position on uh, these five areas, we will be looking at all of those other areas. But um, we, so we developed a framework around those five goals of, of what we could do work together, where, where e the retail industry can align on taking collaborative action. Uh, and at the heart of the Better Retail, Better World initiative was transparency. So to really put actions, targets, uh, commitments in place for retailers, uh, that they are publicly demonstrating what they are doing on a number of different areas. That they are taking serious action uh, and we want to be held accountable from uh, the, the general public as well as our other stakeholders uh, on whether we are actually delivering on what we're committing to doing and as I mentioned above all collaboration so that this is really where the areas where we can work together on and have the greatest impact on. The SDGs as many of you are aware are uh, commitments uh, to 2030 um, 
Now, as a retail industry, as businesses, it's very hard to set uh, long-term targets to 2030, especially when business cycles are much, much shorter than that. So we've taken an approach where we will look at um, two yearly targets, or mostly two yearly targets, all the way up to 2030. That way we can make sure we take account of the changing political climate or, or uh, other new uh, environmental or social challenges come to the forefront. So we can make sure that we are um, addressing the current concerns as well as on a, on a pathway to 2030 through the framework of the UN SDGs. So we've got at the moment uh, targets to 2018. Um, I've put them up on the screen here in front of you. So um, all retailers who, uh, who sign up to the voluntary initiative uh, are committing to those uh, targets under those five goals. Um, today's discussion um, is around responsible consumption production. So I'm just going to focus on um, goal 12 for a moment. But all of this information is on the BRC website um, and happy to pick up any questions that you have on any other areas as well as the responsible consumption and production. So just picking that area in uh, by itself, um, we've been working on this area for a long time and uh, our members have been working through various different initiatives and I've highlighted a number here. So um, first of all, working very closely with RAP, the uh, Waste and Resources uh, Action Program, uh, and they've got uh, the Courtauld 2025 commitment, which a number of retailers as well as manufacturers are signed up to to look at food and drink. Um, environmental impact. Uh, we've got the Sustainable Clothing Action Plan, and again, a number of our members are signed up to contribute to targets under that. And we've got the, the more recent, the Plastics Pact. So commitments to 2025 on uh, looking at plastic and, and how we can uh, improve its environmental impact. But there are also a number of other areas where retailers are committed to. So what's the wording that you see under responsible consumption and production that we all reduce waste to sent to landfill and ensure all operational water use is measured may not seem like overly ambitious and part of that is because it's um, continuing a previously made target that we will divert waste from landfill so that less than 1% of our waste is landfilled by 2020. That was a target set um, uh, seven plus years ago and it's really something that we're still committed to delivering though we recognize that the uh, environmental challenges have moved on then. So we know that for 2020 and onwards we want to have a very robust target that the retail industry can align behind. And we also recognize that um, responsible sourcing practices uh, for key raw materials are essential uh, and we want to be more transparent as an industry about what we are doing on all of these. As a retail industry, we are sourcing you know, hundreds and hundreds of different types of raw materials. Um, and we recognize that some of them are more high profile for different reasons. And whilst we have been doing work on a number of these, such as uh, palm oil, where we've got a commitment that leading retailers have sourced 100% sustainably certified palm oil by the end of 2015. We recognize that that's not the end of the story and so there's still more we can play on, on tackling deforestation or, or other issues uh, with linked to the um, commodities that we are sourcing. So we've got a lot of um, action already underway, um, we, but we are going to be sitting down in 2019 to really identify what those uh, key opportunities are for the retail industry to drive forward collaboratively together and we want to be sitting down with our key stakeholders. Some of those I have just mentioned but there are many others as well. In terms of the companies that have signed up, uh, we've got about uh, 30, just under 30 companies that have signed up um, which you can see on the screen there. So many of the largest retailers right across the UK um, and we're delighted to announce uh, only last week that we had three new signatories, uh, which are at the very top of the screen there. So Gap, Dr. Martins, and Mothercare. Um, but uh, we are at the start of this journey, and we, we expect to see many more retailers uh, joining this initiative and working with us to really demonstrate uh, and progress uh, the, the uh, beneficial impact of the, of the retail industry, not just here in the UK, but right across the world. So um, I'm going to uh, leave you with a, an example of um, a video, um, a short video that's 
uh, one of our signatories has put out around the circular economy, so very uh, closely linked to the responsible consumption and production agenda. Uh, and that um, will come up as a link in the chat box uh, on your screen. So please do click on that. It'll take about two and a half minutes to, to view, but it's quite a powerful, inspirational video. Um, and following that, uh, you'll be hearing from uh, another signatory co-op uh, to talk about more about their responsible consumption and production agenda that they're working on. So thank you for your time. I will um, uh, leave you with that video. Um, and uh, look forward to your questions at the end of the session. Thank you, Peter. That was excellent. Really insightful presentation, giving us a really good flavor of the Better Retail, Better World initiative. So looking forward to watching the video now. Thank you. I uh, hope you're all able to, to view that okay. Um, so we'll maybe pause on questions for, for Peter and just go straight on to Ian if you're with us. Um, I'm here, yes. Good stuff. So I'm just going to pass over to you. Okay. So you should be able to see my screen, is that correct? Yep, we can indeed. Make it make it clear. Okay, right. My name is Ian Ferguson. Uh, I'm the environment manager at the Cooperative Food, and I want to talk to you today about how uh, our food waste reduction fits into SG, SDG 12.3, uh, and how we're going about uh, addressing the issue of food waste. So, as Peter's told you, these are all the sustainable development goals. And the one that we've got to look at today is SDG 12, which is Responsible Consumption and Production, which has all these targets in it. Now, Peter's talked about some of those targets. The one I want to pull out particularly is number three on that list, which says by 2030, we will have um, per capita global food waste at the retail and consumer levels. Let me just move that out. 
Got the uh, go to the meeting thing. Should be down there. Um, and reduce food losses along the production and supply chains, including post harvest losses. Now, this forms a major part of our work to achieve the RAP Cotol 2025 target. We've been signatories to the RAP, uh, the Cotol target since 2006 when it started, uh, and the, the action on food waste has only ramped up in that time. So, the 2025 target is an ambitious collaborative action to cut the resource needed to provide our food and drink by one fifth over 10 years. Um, and also 12.3 is one of the drivers behind the RAP IGD UK Food Waste Reduction Roadmap. And so this is the uh, what the IGD RAP UK Food Waste Reduction Roadmap looks like. Uh, it was launched on the 25th of September. It uses the food loss and waste standard, which is available to download from the internet as a starting point. Um, so it's, it's based on um, established information and established measurement methods. Uh, it has most of the major re UK retailers involved, um, Sainsbury's, LD, Lidl, M&S, Morrison's, Waitrose, and, Asda, and of course, the co-op. Um, there are many leading brands and major suppliers also involved. Some of the retailers mentioned there are already, republic, well, already publicly reporting food waste. Uh, the Corp will do so uh, early next year and will report along with historical data back to our baseline year, which we set as 2015. It's important to set a baseline year so you know the direction of travel. This roadmap has increased pressure to report, but we were already looking at doing that, and well, we were already preparing to do that anyway. But we will see more of our competitors, more retailers, and more suppliers reporting. Uh, and we have been active contributors to the development of this roadmap. So we're happy with where the direction it's going. And most of the other, well, everybody else who's been involved is also happy with the direction it's going. Um, the roadmap commits uh, to align, uh, the roadmap commitments align completely with the, the work we're doing on food waste across our own operations and with our work with suppliers and uh, measuring, reporting and reducing their food waste. And we also have an ambition on uh, food waste in the future of food, uh, and that is we'll aim to cut edible food waste between farm and fork, between farm and store to zero by 2030. Sorry, farm and fork is a bit harder to do. How do we achieve this? How do we go about doing this? Well. Food waste is generated by activities within the retail supply chain, um, and particularly within the retail business itself, it can be influenced by many touch points. So we need a, a cross-functional working group to look at this. Um, we look at waste and recycling, we meet on a quarterly basis. Uh, we look at food waste reduction and updates and tonnages, um, as standing agenda items, uh, we, I organise the meetings, um, but we have reputation from operations, people who run the stores, profitable sales who do um, forecasting and replenishment information, uh, estates who uh, actually build the stores but also deal with the waste after it's uh, after leave the stores, procurement who deal with the contract for waste, social goals who look at the uh, the wider aspects of this and the reporting. Technical, a very important part of the play, which you'll see shortly, and the community. Um, the exchange of information, we need to make sure that the work we, we do is shared to avoid uh, issues, to avoid duplication. Um, we look at the potential for more interventions to reduce food waste and to ensure that we are considering all the impacts of our changes on waste management so that we uh, we, we capture the savings and bank them. And how we do this, we, we use the, the food and drink material hierarchy, which uh, looks at prevention at its top and disposal of the worst case at the bottom. Now, most of our work sits in the prevention and recycling area. Uh, and I've split the prevention into the different areas. Now, at the top of that hierarchy, the interventions are preferred because they, they drive more um, more impact on the food waste, but they're also financially 
better for us to to implement. Um, it costs us money, in effect, the further we go down. So right at the top, we have technical interventions to increase shelf life. So things like putting stakes in skin pack, that increases shelf life, but there are other things we're doing. Um, we have what we call a dynamic produce shelf life system. That means we look at the, um, the shelf life of produce all the way through the year uh, and adjust it depending on the quality of the produce that's coming in, uh, the, the, the season, the harvest information, all that means that we can get as much shelf life out of the product as possible or drop that shelf life down if the if the quality's got to disappoint the customer if we have too long a shelf life. We also have um you know technical look at uh, product withdrawals and look at the, take a, a pragmatic view of, of what they will withdraw and what they can safely leave on the shelf. Um and that will reduce food waste as well because every time we withdraw a product from shelf, you have to put it somewhere, and it usually means it's going to go into the bin. Um, the profitable sales and buying team look at make sure we've got the right product in the right store, because there's no point putting something in the store that's not going to sell. That's just going to drive food waste. Um, they also look at forecasting and replenishment, and there are moves afoot to improve that further. The operations team look at things like improved reduced to clear processes to get the as much value out of the product as possible, but also to get as little product going in the bin as possible. Uh, and they measure stores on their compliance with that. And then operations also do the redistribution, redistribution, blah, excuse me, redistribution from store to local charities. So our stores uh, are starting the process, they're well on the way of the process of partnering with local charities to get food that is um, close to best before out to local charities, but also food that is close to its use by date, so it's, it's product safety date. Um, charities that are going to take food that is close to its use by date need to have a, an arrangement where they come into the store at the end of the working day to take the food away and cook it quickly or freeze it quickly so that it remains safe. And the last stage in our a hierarchy is sending what's left to anaerobic digestion. It doesn't go to landfill, it gets the, the packaging stripped off it and it's used to create energy. <clears throat> what we don't do uh, currently is send product to animal feed. Um, it, because of the, the nature of our store estate with lots and lots of small convenience stores, uh, we struggle with that, but we need to uh, investigate that and we are talking to wrap about what we can possibly do on that. So this is the overview of the alignment with our business. Um, we have committed to the SGT 12.3 to reduce food waste by 50% by 2030. Um, we've adopted that as the target. We've set the baseline of 2015. We've measured the food waste using a bottom method, which is best practice. More on that in a moment. We use that data to plan and deliver food waste reductions. So uh, we can use the, the bottom of the approach to give us better information on interventions. We work in partnership with our suppliers to reduce their food waste. Um, we're already engaged with suppliers on food waste, uh, and more of that again later. And we engage with consumers at home to reduce food waste, and we have information on that coming up as well. And we've committed to report publicly in 2019 the Cotware report. Um, and we've, we've already committed that publicly in 2018. So waste by weight on food is the gold standard. Um, previous years, we've used the weigh bridge data from our waste contract to measure food waste. Uh, it's inaccurate for a number of reasons. Um, the estimate adjustment has to be made for packaging. Most people do the same as us. We use 15% as a, as a figure. Um, then the numbers that can be used though vary between 10 and 20 percent so you can see straight away there's a large inaccuracy there we handle food waste for other crop societies strangely the co-op isn't just one business across the uk there are a number of uh, larger uh, societies uh, not larger than the co-op group but large in comparison to 
um, some small businesses around the country. So um, our control is only over our own operations. So we have to make adjustments to take this into account. Those adjustments have been refined over the years, but they still add quite a lot of inaccuracy. Uh, and then we have animal byproducts, which we handled separately, uh, and our weight data on those was poor. So we've built a database of product net weights, which is actually a huge job, because we have to do that not just for our own products, which we have a good handle on, but also all the, the branded products. Uh, now you might think that would be straightforward, but when you start looking at bakery, you'll find that it's very complicated because uh, although your, your standard um, loaves have got a set weight, uh, your pack of four croissants or six um, scotch pancakes don't have that set weight. Um, doing this gives us faster, more accurate reporting, allowing us to measure the effect of interventions more accurately and more quickly. Um, it allows us to know the reasons for waste and to measure store compliance. And then also we can relate that food waste to the weight of sales, which gives us a better comparison with competitors. And it makes it easier to give a, a better narrative. If we say, for example, we, we've wasted 200,000 tonnes, that's just, it's not the number we use, by the way, 200,000 tonnes of food, it sounds enormous. But if we were to say that was 1% of what we sold, it starts to put it into context. So, the technical interventions, the key questions we ask of suppliers, when was the last time that shelf life data was reviewed? Does that include raw materials and work in progress? If you can get those things right, you can get better shelf life on shelf for the customer and for the store. How close are we to the target minimum guaranteed life? Are, are they hanging on to project products that they should have in our depots? Are they making things too far ahead? and giving us too short a life. It makes a big difference to waste. And then what innovations and technologies are being explored to challenge shelf life and quality optimization? So that could be um, new processing methods, it could be the use of enzymes in bread, or it could be new packaging technology to extend shelf life. The commercial trading and the operational food waste reduction things look at forecasting and insights. So we need to improve forecasting. If we don't have, you know, if, if we don't forecast for the weather, we can be putting salad in the store when it's cold weather and wasting food. Or alternatively, we could be putting um, stews and and what you know vegetables that people eat in the winter in the store when the weather is really nice. Um, we need to get the right product in the right store, of course. We need to get more information for the buyers and the supply chain, and especially for suppliers, to reduce the cost and waste of weight. Um, we have the introduction of ambient-specific analysts working alongside the stock exit team to deliver an ambient waste reduction plan and engage with stores on charitable distribution opportunities. And we've got an end-to-end -end review of the short-coated stock process to reduce waste quantity of short coded stock. So that, that sounds very technical, but I'm sure uh, you'll understand what that means. Um, <clears throat> we have, in the operations side, we have the waste routines compliance. We've got targeted improvement plan for the stores on key waste KPIs. They're working with the, cons the consistently unperforming stores to close the gap with better performing stores to bring everybody up to the best standard. Um, the weekly KPI report is embedded and used to coach store teams and drive compliance forwards. Uh, and we've reduced the review, the reduced to clear procedures to simplify and improve effectiveness. So less touch points for the store staff to improve um, compliance and more effective so that we get less in the bin and more sold at the higher price. So it's good for us and it's good for the bins. Uh, and then we've simplified and improving, improved code checking and the subsequent reductions, um, we're using a store tablet for that. That will replace having to record the items, so reducing um, st store labor time because of the manual store check we have currently. Um, and then the store, the tablet notifies the store staff of the reductions, which cuts time and avoids missing reduced products. 
and then we have a, had a program of redistribution from store um, working with charity partners to address that, the gap in the food waste hierarchy uh, we launched it in may 2018 at our agm got huge coverage in the national press um, it's very very popular with on social media very emotive we have 500 active store partnerships so far uh, and the, the team at this head office are setting up around 30 a week um, we've had 700,000 products donated so far uh, and we've got comms coming up for on success stories internally and encouraging applications on social media the benefits for us are that it's flexible and relationship led uh, with a community engagement model um, we've got use by products included uh, we've got reduction in backhaul costs so it's a benefit to us that's 150,000 pounds a year less in, in the cost of sending goods, uh, sending surplus goods back to the depots for treatment. Um, the limitations, the redistribution of charity will not eradicate all food waste from stores. Uh, we know that's a problem. We need to work further up the hierarchy first and maximize this as much as possible. But we also need to find other interventions to reduce food waste even more. Um, the business ca back case is backed up with experience to the launch. So we're we'll expecting about 1,500 stores will be able to be linked to a partner who will collect three days a week, which uh, and we're expecting a 25% churn in charity relationships. But we're expecting a reduction of 20 to 30% of store level food waste. So then we've got a program of supplier food waste reduction engagement. Um, we're using an online portal called Manufacture 2030 to engage with suppliers. We've already started by um, promoting your business's food, which is a very useful wrap tool for looking at food waste. Uh, and if anybody wants to join Manufacture 2030, I'm sure we can arrange it. Uh, and you can download the tools from there, or you can go onto the wrap website and download your business's food from there. We also, on there, we're putting on peer-to-peer -peer case studies. So we've got content being produced with all and brand suppliers, including how to set up redistribution to supplier staff and to community hubs. So we've got Farn as an outstanding example of that. Uh, Farn's in our salmon supplier in, in uh, the Scottish borders. We're working with RAP and our suppliers to promote your business food toolkit. Um, and fresh time case study on that used 500 fewer salmon. 6,000 fewer chickens and five tons less of feta cheese. They're huge numbers. Then we've got our technical team doing direct supplier engagement on food waste reductions. And these are some examples of things they're looking at. They're looking at allowing pastry rework. Up to 30% of pastry recutoffs can be reworked back into the door uh, and it doesn't impact the quality. We've got edge piece inclusion on brownies and flat, flapjacks. Um, previously, we were cutting the, the edges off brownies all the nice crusty bits that everybody loves were taken and they were going in the bin. So now they're going in to be sold to customers. Uh, we've got one of our suppliers sending waste bread to the toast ale pro project where they make uh, pale ale from it. We've looked at changing ways of working to capture all the filling on sandwiches first time, putting mayonnaise on both sides of the bread so more filling sticks and less falls onto the, onto the belt. It's pretty simple stuff really, but um, Something needs to think of it in the first place. Um, and we're investigating production methods that reduce the cracking of the loaf that cause it to reject. The most important piece, though, um, in terms of the, the biggest impact we need to reach is customer food waste reduction. Customers are responsible for wasting nearly 70% of food waste. That's not including the farm level and they're the hardest group to influence. Most customers underestimate their food waste. And the three biggest causes are buying too much, storing what they buy incorrectly, and cooking more than is needed. That's things like rice and pasta, where when you put dry rice or dry pasta in a pan, it doesn't look very much, but when you cook it, it swells up enormously. So our interventions include putting prominent storage advice on 350 fruit and vegetable lines, including on loose produce bags, 
and you can see it a uh, third icon down on those royal gala apples putting portion indicators on the side of rice and pasta packs so that those are average adult portions and that's the the strip down the right hand side of the slide um, we don't put weight portioning on we put average adult portioning on because we think that's most valuable and that's for people who haven't got scales or can't be able to get the scales out we put clear advice on freezing or suitable for freezing on the packs uh, you see that as the, uh, the thing says advice on freezing uh, and we put top tips on 230 products for example five spread which is that on an advice as well um, and also there's a top tip on apples that's stewing them with the raisins and serving with yogurt um, so bread's one of the top 10 wasted products And the last slide is this is our last customer intervention, um, which is putting information in all our customer magazines about using up the uh, the ingredients that might be used in the recipe. We, you know, you might be having half a can of potato milk, so you can use the sorry the coconut milk. You can use the coconut milk up in, in other things. Um, you can use up the apple sauce to improve the quality of your cakes. Um, use it the kale etc some of it's fairly straightforward and you might you know think well why do we have to tell people that but the problem is that a lot of people don't have um, cooking, cooking skills and they need to be told sometimes and this is a, a nice gentle way of telling people so that's the end of my presentation back to you at the, at the, the ranch so let me move this Okay, thank you very much, Ian. Um, that was very okay. insightful. Um, really useful to see uh, sort of a practical case study and what a particular company is doing, uh, really bringing the SDGs to life. Um, we're now going to move into some questions and answers. Um, there were a couple of questions that came through in the comment box. Uh, maybe the first one is, is more targeted at Peter, and then the next one could be answered by both. So the first question was, I think, from Fran. Who's asking from uh, that within SDG 13? Are there specific targets that you're working on? And there's a second question from Craig from Northern Ireland uh, asking whether the take up or the, or the coverage of the Better Retail, Better World um, and also the co ops initiatives have they been covered right across the UK, including the devolved regions? Okay, it's Peter here. If I go first. So a uh, question on uh, SDG 12 and, and commitments there. Um, th this is, uh, uh, yes we do. So one of the targets is uh, we will collaborate as retailers to reduce deforestation in order to have eliminated it by no later than 2030. Um, and that's uh, right across all of the um, retail uh, raw materials sourcing. Uh, so it's quite, it's bigger than some of the other existing commitments which target uh, just one or two commodities. Um, and we've also got uh, a, um, an existing 2020 target uh, on climate action where uh, retailers are uh, progressing against uh, reductions in CO2 emissions from uh, store operations and we will be reporting that in 2020. But again, uh, we want to be sitting down next year and onwards to really firm up a, a better, a clearer target for post-2020. Uh, the second question in terms of uh, distribution, yeah, um, the, the, the signatories to Better Retail, Better World are, are right across uh, the UK, across all of the different devolved. Um, so we're, they're all contributing in different ways and, and we'll want to pull out case studies on what they're doing in different areas to promote. Can I just pick up on that one as well? Um, we are obviously talking to our supply chain um, across the whole of the UK and Northern Ireland, um, and one of the, one of our big suppliers is Dumbia, and we know that we get a lot of um, excellent um, agricultural products from from Northern Ireland and and the Republic. Um, so I've been talking to uh, IGD about workshops for suppliers. Um, you now workshops for suppliers are often um, in London or Birmingham and I said no we need to take the workshops where the suppliers are uh, so we're talking about the potential for doing them in East Anglia in Scotland and you know the potential for doing one in Northern Ireland as well 
So we're thinking about that carefully. Okay, thank you both. Um, I'll just now open up to the floor uh, in case there's any other questions that people want to ask. So uh, please feel free to unmute your, your microphone and fire away with a question if you have one. If not, I have quite a few questions that I might line up afterwards. Okay, well, in that case, I'll kick off. Um, so it's quite clear that I suppose uh, retail outlets and the retail sector uh, have a potentially quite a massive impact on the amount uh, that we're consuming. Um, and I suppose retail outlets are the, the key facilitator or the key uh, vehicle through which humans can consume. Um, in that context, do you feel that the SDGs have added value um, to what the retail sector is doing, i.e. are they doing anything over and above uh, what they would already be doing within their sort of corporate social responsibility commitments? Um, Go on, Peter. Okay, I was just going to say uh, yes. Um, so what, what the SDGs have done is they've really set um, a, a wider framework that um, enables retailers to look at all different areas. So they've been working together um, and individually on, on addressing a lot of these challenges, but um, there may be some areas that they, they haven't um, uh, focused on as much uh, in the past, and so the SDGs have really provided that opportunity to, to work um, on these issues, but also work with others to address things that may have seemed too difficult as an individual business, but actually they can they can have a, a greater chance of impact by working together with others, whether that's civil society, whether that's partnering in public-private partnerships, or whether it's working with uh, competitors or even just with the supply chain. Yes, I would say that they, they give a framework for talking to the business to help you to, to get action on, on some of the perhaps uh, the less um, flavor of the month um, initiatives, but they also allow you to uh, exchange best practice because everybody else is working on the same things, so it helps you to move on faster. Very good, thank you. Um, and just another question from me, um, I'm sure we'll all have seen the uh, commotion around the Greenpeace advert and the Iceland advert um, over the weekend. Do you have any initial thoughts on that, uh, the palm oil advert? Um, yes, the, the palm oil is a, a, a very efficient crop for producing for producing oil. It's about four times more efficient than any other oil-bearing crop. So if we stop using palm oil, uh, we, we have the potential for increased deforestation, not reduced deforestation. So we need to find a way to make palm oil more sustainable, much, much more sustainable, but shifting out of it is unlikely to be the, the best option. And I'll just add to that that um, you know the, the SDGs don't focus on a, a particular commodity, and that's because of of some of those potential unintended consequences that Ian referred to. So we need to be focusing on the, the big picture. The big picture is deforestation, you know, climate action, and, and so on. And so any choices or changes that we as retailers are, are considering we do need to look at it in that context so what is the impact if we do this what's the impact if we do that and I think therefore um, it, it can be quite challenging to uh, just focus on a particular commodity without uh, a, a better alternative uh, available. Great, uh, I'll open up to the floor for any other questions, uh, I have one more but if there's any others that want to go ahead first. Hi there. Can you hear me, guys? Yep. Yes. Hi, um, it's Craig here again. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the involvement of the charitable sector. Uh, Ian, in your presentation, you certainly mentioned it a few times. Uh, yeah. So I just want to get a, a sense from you about um, to what extent is the charity charitable sector involved, the NGOs involved, and um, what could be done to have more uh, involvement from them? 
And well, the, the charitable sector is involved in our initiative on redistribution of food waste from store, and it tends to be uh, local charities. So, for example, uh, here in Manchester, um, we will redistribute food to a, a charity called Barnabas, um, which feeds the homeless. So that's the sort of level of uh, NGO involvement there. But we do talk to NGOs about food waste. Uh, and we, we've been involved with uh, with Tier Fund about setting the target and setting a roadmap. It's not huge, to be honest. It's, it's bigger in other areas. So, for example, we'll we'll talk to Greenpeace about packaging. Um, so, food waste is much more an industry-focused initiative. Okay. Thank you. And I'll just add uh, on Better Retail, Better World. Yeah, we, uh, you know, a big part of developing what we uh, came up with was involved discussions with a wide range of, of different stakeholders, including um, NGOs. And actually, uh, WWF uh, supported the initiative at the launch. Um, and uh, yeah, we want to very much continue that dialogue. Okay, thanks. Just wondering, Peter, are there any um, retailers that have specifically chosen not to join the initiative? Um, is there any reason for that? No, obviously we've we've not got every retailer signed up yet. Um, I think uh, retailers are facing different challenges, and as I mentioned at the very start of the presentation, um, you know the the high streets are in a real having a really challenging time at the moment. Yeah, and uh, uh, and. It may not always be easy for a retailer to, to focus on a bit of a longer term initiative when they are really looking at the day to day struggles that they're facing. So there were certain challenges around that. Everyone thought it was a good idea. It's just uh, their ability to sign up at this stage, I think, was, was uh, not always um, feasible. Yeah. Can I, on the food waste side of things, most of the uh, retailers, the large retailers, um, are signed up for the RAP IGD goals, so, so what Peter hasn't caught, the RAP IGD work will catch. Yeah. The, the benefit of the, the BRC work is that it's a it's a, an industry wide report covering lots and lots of areas where the RAP IGD work will just look at food waste. Sure. Okay. Well, no final questions from anyone. All right, well, in that case, I'm just going to thank our speakers uh, both very much for preparing their presentations and tuning in today. Much appreciated. It's been uh, very useful to see that sort of practical uh, example of the SDGs in action and a particular sector embracing the SDGs to try and change their practices from within. Um, so that's been very useful. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. Um, so that's it for now. And um, there may be a webinar again in the future, but um for now Connor. thank you for tuning in hello Con Connor, can i just say if there are any more questions later we can deal with them later if necessary um sure. but also if there are any co-op suppliers out there who aren't on manufacture 2030 please get in touch and we'll we'll get you on because it's a really valuable resource for you thank you ian much appreciated thanks, okay. Connor. thanks everyone cheers peter thank you thanks thanks bye, -bye. Hey. Thank you.